Perhaps the ultimate test of a croc's body is in a head-to-head -head battle with another croc. And in the competition for food, other predators are always a threat. This gladiator's defense lies in its skin. This is the skin from the bottom of the head under the jaw, continuing through the belly region all the way down to where the tail would begin. And we're looking at the belly surface of this animal, and you notice that it's a very light color. And this allows this animal to be countershaded, so prey that are below this crocodile looking up at it might not see it against the light color of the sky shining through the water. And you notice also that this belly surface is actually relatively smooth, even though it's armor plated. And that would allow this animal to easily slide along the mud flats if it's on the you know, bank of the river and it wants to slide back into the river. But if we look at the other side of the animal, the back is very dark. So a uh, wildebeest standing on the shore of, of, the, of the river might not see this crocodile swimming back up against the bank, because when you look down into the water, it looks dark. But the other thing is that it's not smooth anymore, like it is on the belly. It's actually got a lot of bumps on it that are raised up quite a bit in the back here as you get towards the tail. Kind of looks like those spines you always imagine on a dragon going down its back. And this makes for wonderful armor. So if, if this animal was in a fight with another big male crocodile, this would keep the animal protected. So it's a, it's a wonderful bit of armor plating. In fact, even the ancient Egyptians and the Romans used this as armor. They would actually dry off an alligator skin, prepare it, and wear it as armor. So if we look at this armor more closely, uh, we're actually going to try and understand the structure of it. Let's take a look at one of these scutes. So if we pull one off by dissecting it off here, it's actually quite hard to cut through the skin here. If this were easy to cut through, it wouldn't be very good armor, would it? We see a lot of thick skin here, a lot of connective tissue. Let's take a look at what's inside one of these. We have a whole bunch of bones here that have been cleaned off, so you don't see the skin anymore. And they actually overlap one over the next, just like this. Leaving them overlap like that allows no chinks in the armor. So these animals are quite well protected when these armor plates are overlapping. The croc's bony skin is an excellent shield. But in order for this cold-blooded animal to survive, it needs to absorb heat through this thick skin. It achieves this through a remarkable mechanism deep within the armor. Joy wants to investigate one of the bony plates to find out how they keep the croc warm. Let's take a look at one of these that's been cut so we can see the inside of it. You can see very, very fine little channels running up and down here. These fine little channels are actually for blood vessels that are running up and down through the plate all the way to the surface. And then those blood vessels are going to run underneath the skin. So this animal is going to be able to absorb a lot of energy from the sun, which is going to heat up those, the blood vessels and then be able to carry the heat back into the animal, kind of like a big solar panel. So that is going to allow a lot of heat exchange to occur all along the back of the animal. From its bone-crushing bite, to its armor-plated solar panels, the teams demonstrated the effectiveness of the croc's prehistoric adaptations. But the crocodile has something else that may hold the key to its survival. At the University of California, Irvine, physiologist James Hicks is studying how warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals react to changes in temperature. Well, what we did was we just brought in an alligator and a rabbit from a warm room and brought them into a room here that's at 15 degrees centigrade. And what we're doing here is looking at the amount of heat that is radiating from these animals as they have been brought into a cooler room. The difference between a, a warm-blooded animal and the cold-blooded animal is not the actual body temperature, but the fact that the warm-blooded animal, like the rabbit, generates its body temperature from having a high metabolism. And the reptile has a body temperature that's a result of an outside heat source, like the sun. So we notice that snakes and lizards and alligators and turtles spend time basking in the sun. Now, if we look at John, our graduate student here, show us your arm, John. You can see John is quite red. We look up at his face. 
very red. He's radiating heat off because he's an endotherm, a warm-blooded animal. He's generating a lot of metabolic heat, and it's just radiating off his body. The rabbit looks blue, but it's not because it's cold-blooded. It's because the fur is retaining the heat inside its body, and the surface of the fur is very cold, as it is in the room here. If we look over at our alligator that we brought in, you can see the tips of the feet are starting to become blue. And eventually, over time, this animal will become, the alligator will become the same temperature as the room. Ectothermia or cold bloodedness is a, is a very interesting survival strategy because you do not require as much energy per day. When the environment becomes fairly patchy, if there is a reduction in the amount of resources available, if prey disappear or move off to some different location, cold blooded animals can just hunker down and survive because they're just not requiring much energy every day. Whereas a warm blooded animal would have to continue eating. So this is just an alternative strategy uh, to be cold-blooded, and it's a very uh, successful one as these animals have been around for 250 million, 300 million years. Being cold-blooded offers an important survival advantage. Scientists investigating these cave-dwelling crocs in Madagascar were amazed to find them surviving in such cool conditions. These animals could be living proof that because crocodiles are cold-blooded, they can slow down their body's metabolism and survive harsh times on a bare minimum of food and warmth.